It's going to be a, a slightly biased view, but I will try to uh, also uh, report on, uh, I mean, broadly on, on, on various topics. So um, let me first mention what do I mean by verification. So verification is, uh, well, in, in one sense, it can be seen as uh, a set of techniques to, to show that uh, a system is working, is, is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, in a slightly broader sense, uh, it also includes uh, something that is called uh, control synthesis uh, and has many other names. Uh, basically, it's about not only checking that these devices are working, but uh, having devices that uh, you don't really know what they should do exactly. I mean, you have some uh, axiomatic definition of what should it be doing, but uh, I mean, programming it properly so that it's really doing what it should be doing is hard and you need some help. So you want to synthesize, uh, automatically create a controller for these devices. Of course, this is, uh, for now, uh, it's impossible to, uh, to uh, check things like, uh, like uh, like a space shuttle or, or, or anything of, of this uh, degree of uh, complexity. Nevertheless, uh, we still want to check parts of these things and there verification still struggles and uh, that's where we need help from learning. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, first give a brief introduction to this idea, what, uh, what these two fields have in common and uh, what one can offer to the other. Secondly, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples. So there is no unifying theory of how these things work yet. Uh, these things are pretty new uh, and uh, in, let's say a recent uh, four years. And the best I can give you is uh, a set of examples and then try to generalize what we could be aiming for in, uh, in, 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 uh, for other questions. Okay, so I'm going to focus on, uh, on two areas uh, a bit more. First of all, we want to get these things working. So we want to maybe synthesize these controllers and, uh, or check that no matter what kind of scheduling happens in these systems, that the systems still work. So this boils down to this controller synthesis. Sometimes you uh, hear about this, these controllers under the name of schedulers, policies, strategies, it's all the same, it just depends on the community or on the particular problem, how you call it. But it's typically the way how to resolve non-determinism. So I'm going to speak about how you can compute these things uh, and for that I will mostly use uh, uh, reinforcement learning as someone who helps me. And secondly, I'm going to speak about uh, how to represent these things so that they are actually useful. For that, I will use a, a different uh, branch of, of learning, uh, namely decision trees. And then I will also give you a, a further examples, <coughs> different domains, so that you have a bit uh, broader overview of uh, what is out there. Good, so uh, on the one hand, we have formal methods, verification, uh, that can synthesize our controllers uh, in a very precise and exact way. They are guaranteed to be, uh, to be uh, correct. Uh, so here we have an anonymous uh, tool that can synthesize our controllers. So let's just call it synthesizer so that I don't offend uh, producers of any other tools uh, that are sitting in the room. And uh, well, no matter which tool it is, uh, it has issues. It has scalability issues. It just doesn't really work for real life uh, systems um, because they are too large, too complex. But in principle, it's exactly what we would like to have. And uh, if you, it's a push button technology. So you push the button, you get a mem out. Then you work hard, you get a timeout. And then you work even harder, and in the end, you get something out of the, out of the system, and this is the strategy. And you come up with uh, this picture as, as, a, as a victorious to the engineers, and you tell them, look, this is what you need. And then they tell you, like, well, I don't understand this. I don't believe this. I mean, why should this be working? I mean, I'm go not going to use this. I mean, uh, convince me that it actually, convince me that this, this does the job. Okay, and then you show, like, uh, 
proof through a run of a model checker and then he just says like, yeah, well, first of all, I don't really believe your model checkers and secondly, I mean, if I'm going to use this, uh, I need to maintain this. I need to make small changes here and there. I need to understand what is happening. And I need to certify this. So I need to track the requirements all the way to the code. So tell me where it's handled that uh, the, the car is braking when the car in front of you is, is too close. Okay? So this is something that uh, uh, verification hasn't been focusing on. So we are very happy about uh, giving the result, but not really about presenting the result in digestible form. So we have these two worlds of, uh, of formal methods where we have uh, precise results, uh, but we have uh, issues with scalability, we have issues with, with presentations and uh, with usability. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, the hot uh, learning area where it doesn't really come with uh, strong guarantees. All we can hope for are probably approximately correct. So, I mean, this is far from correct, right? It's probably and approximately and... Uh, so is this enough, uh, or is this, is this to be trusted? Is, is, and even, even, even PAC uh, is, uh, is often not the technique that is used in practice. Uh, uh, I, when I spoke at some point uh, of time to people who designed uh, one of the most famous uh, PAC mechanisms for learning in uh, Markov decision processes, I'll speak about that later, uh, then I was told, well, we actually like our alg algorithm from a theoretical point of view, but we would never use it. I mean, it's, it's, it's useless uh, for practical purposes. Uh, but it gives you the guarantees. So how do we merge these things? Well, learning is definitely uh, well known for its sc uh, scalability, okay, ability to handle large systems, and ability to prefer simple solutions okay, to, the, to the complex ones. Not always, uh, but it has, it has at least the potential. Whereas in verification, we haven't really been aiming for that at all. Okay, so uh, why don't we use learning instead or why don't we somehow merge them? Well, one of the issues is that, of course, in, uh, in learning, the questions one asks are slightly different. That doesn't mean that we cannot really use the techniques, but uh, we first have to modify them. Uh, so that they answer similar questions that, uh, that we ask uh, over here. And uh, secondly, there is still this, this, this issue that I mean, the results that we're going to get from, from learning are not guaranteed to be correct. So what do we do, do about that? So of course, something that has been happening over the past, uh, I would say, five years is that... Uh, people have been trying to merge these areas so that you have a sort of compromise between the precision and the scalability. And uh, so you can uh, pick your point on the scale and uh, go for something that is, yeah, I mean, with kind of guarantees uh, and scales a bit better than, than before. Of course, what we really want is to somehow closely intertwine the two so that in the end we get the both, best of both worlds. Uh, so... How would that possibly work? Well, what formal methods uh, verification is, is very good at is having uh, precise computations on a small bunch of data. Okay, so we have a, only a tiny bit of information and we can process it using our algorithms with uh, exponentially, double exponentially or triple exponential complexity and, uh, and we are uh, having uh, the answer we want. Okay, now uh, this itself is useless because our systems are much larger. Okay, so we have uh, then learner here who can handle larger data and can actually pinpoint what seems to be the most important part of our problem and passes this vague, almost undefinable information. I have a feeling this could be important for you to the verification part there we can do some more computation that is actually doing exactly what we want. And we give this as feedback back to the learner so that it can advise us better. So it's communication between two partners, each doing something uh, slightly different, but all together uh, being much more efficient and uh, getting, the, getting the guarantees as well. And I will illustrate this concept on a couple of examples. 
actually, I mean, the rest of the lecture is mostly examples uh, on, on this point to convince you that uh, the potential is still there, is there although yet uh, there is no systematic theory of this and uh, the, the number of results is still quite limited. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to use uh, for, well, significant part of the lecture is the following model that you have uh, most probably all seen. So let me just introduce uh, my notation so that we are, uh, uh, we are on the same page with, uh, with the symbols. So this is uh, a Markov decision process. So what is that? We have a set of states. Uh, so one of them is initial state. And uh, in each uh, state, uh, we can pick one of the actions. So, I mean, here in the initial state, we have two possibilities, up and down. And if we pick down, then uh, it's not sure where we end up. And with 99%, uh, we end up in T. With 1%, we end up in S. And then in S, we can pick between A and B. I mean, up and down are not available here. So, this is what is captured in the transition function over here. So, we can be uh, given a, set, a state and an action it tells us what is the distribution of the successor states, and possibly it tells us that uh, the action is not available there. Okay, so this is a very simple example of, uh, of a Markov decision process. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, if there are any questions uh, concerning, well, I mean, uh, on, on clarities or notational issues, or you want to uh, recall anything, just ask me. I will uh, repeat the question on the, on the mic and uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer questions while we go through and uh, rather than delaying them to the end because I, I will be building up on top, of, uh, uh, on top of these things. Okay, so this is an example of a Markov decision process. Now, uh, we might be interested in uh, figuring out what is uh, the maximal possible chance of getting to the goal state. Why would we be interested in such a thing? Well, there could be several reasons. One of the setup, possible setups is that uh, there is some non-determinism in your system, say, given by a schedule that you don't know, and then a uh, goal is maybe a dangerous state. Okay, you divide by zero there or whatever, and you want to minimize, uh, or you want to, you want to make sure that uh, this is not happening too frequently. Okay, so we have a random system, so maybe sometimes it fails. I mean, we know that. I mean, our computers rarely work uh, flawlessly all the time. So uh, we accept some degree of, uh, of, of uh, incorrectness, uh, but we want to know what is the probability that, uh, that the machine will fail and so on. So uh, this is a case for standard verification. So no matter what happens, the chance of reaching the goal is smaller than 1%. Okay, so we want to investigate the maximum to see that the maximum is smaller than 1%. Alternatively, we might be willing to synthesize a controller so that we reach the goal. Maybe it's something desirable. Maybe this is actually the, the, the mission's goal. I mean, the robot's supposed to come there and uh, then we want to maximize uh, the probability. Okay, so what we're maximizing over is the strategies, dec uh, decisions, policies, controllers, schedulers, uh, you give it your favorite name, which is just uh, basically telling us uh, which action should we pick. I mean, when being in this state, should we go up or should we go down? And uh, so this is uh, the simplest, uh, well, one of the, one of the simplest uh, reasonable goals in verification, kind of a milestone. So once we uh, make sure that we can solve this one, then we can build on top of that with, with other properties, more complicated properties, and it's already fundamental enough so that it shows uh, uh, most, of the, most of the issues that arise in this context. So, uh, to give you an example, so this is an optimal strategy. So we go down uh, with 99%, we end up in T where, I mean, we are determined to end up in the goal, and as we still have to make a choice, so I mean, uh, we won't really want to go to the goal, so with more uh, half a percent, we have a uh, chance of going through S, T to goal. So altogether, uh, altogether, this thing is something like 0 0.995. Okay? 
Good. So we're on the, all on the same page. Very good. Now, uh, for something more complicated. Well, what are these funny clouds? So these are actually billions of states that I was uh, too lazy to, to draw. And it, they wouldn't fit into the slide and I wouldn't uh, finish the slides anyway. So then uh, I just have these funny clouds. They are supposed to be very complicated, very large parts of the system. Once you observe the picture, uh, it's kind of clear that uh, if there are no transitions from the clouds anywhere else, I mean, you just stay in the cloud, then the task of finding an optimal strategy in this Markov decision process is kind of the same as in the previous one, despite this one being a billion times larger and much more complicated. This is something that verification has hard times to notice, whereas learning can actually see this a bit better. Okay, so this is one of the points uh, uh, where, where learning will, uh, will help us. So let me show you an, uh, an example of an optimal, uh, optimal controller or optimal strategy. So you choose down, uh, in S you choose B, in T you choose C, and in the, these clouds you make these, uh, make these decisions as depicted. Now here is another one, which is entirely different. It differs in billions of decisions, okay? 99% of the controller is completely different. Okay, let me just switch between the two, okay? Of course, these are differences that you don't care about. Okay, they, have, uh, they don't have any impact. Now, one could say, of course, this is a very degenerate uh, example where you can pre-compute that these clouds actually have no effect because uh, you cannot reach the goal at all. And uh, so you could just, uh, you could just, uh, you could just say, okay, I uh, get rid of these and I'm back to the previous example. And there are techniques in, in uh, verification that allow you to do this reasonably cheaply. I mean, you still have to go through the whole system to check all the states. You don't have to do any fancy computation, but I mean, still you have to go through the, through the states. So it's at least like linear complexity. So uh, this is something that you, you don't want to do. And moreover, what if, what if uh, there actually is a transition over here? Then all these guys actually here matter. But how much? I mean, the actual probability that you will ever reach this cloud is at most half a percent. So no matter what you do in the, in the, in the cloud, then uh, the effect on the overall value, what you get here, is at most half a percent. So if you're able to tolerate, say, half a percent uh, of imprecision, then you can safely ignore it. And you know that you're not ignoring more than you should be ignoring. And this is already something that is very hard to, to recognize. And this is something for which, I mean, there are no standard verification uh, techniques. OK, so then in the end, you realize that this is the controller that uh, you want to present to someone. And then maybe if someone tells you, well, I don't really care about uh, not even half a percent imprecision, even like 2% is fine. It's OK. Then uh, you can further simplify your uh, controller so that you forget about the B. I mean, if you happen to choose A, well, uh, you lose some probability, but it's not that bad. You can definitely forget about C because anyway, you don't have any other choice. And actually, it boils down to a simple question. Uh, is the action that you want to play down? If yes, that's a good idea to do that. If you want to play something else, that's a bad idea to do that. Okay, and then with this simple rule, uh, you actually win the game. Okay? Almost as well as if you analyze the whole billion state system. So this is, on a very intuitive level, uh, something that I'm going to present in the next hour or two, and with all the, all the details how to make things work, and uh, I'll try to be also a bit more generic so that uh, you get an idea how you could possibly apply this philosophy for your favorite problem. Okay, so what I'm going to, what I'm going to start with is uh, the issue of how to compute the strategy 
And then later on, I'm going to discuss how to actually represent it in a way that it's understandable for, for the engineers uh, so that they can see where the problem is or when the, a bug is reported, you don't get a, a trace of length uh, million, but uh, maybe you rather get uh, reasoning why this, this bug is occurring and where the problem is. Okay. So let me start with, uh, with this strategy computation, and uh, I will start with uh, the, the problem for, uh, with the problem of, of reachability in Markov decision processes, as in the example, and then later on I'll show you how, can, uh, how you can go further and what you need to do when you want to take a different system or take a different objective uh, to, to be verified. So just to give a bit of background, uh, I mean, there are plenty of techniques in verification that can do this for you. From a theoretical perspective, you have linear programming, which solves the job, uh, it does the job, it solves this uh, exactly, so it gives you exactly the number, not even uh, with a small imprecision, I mean, it's exactly the, the, the rational number that you want, and it works in polynomial time. Hooray, but well, no one ever uses this, okay? It does, it's, well, when I first heard about linear programming and someone told me, oh, it scales to like hundreds of thousands of variables, no problem, I was, uh, I was amazed. I mean, this was like, wow, very nice. I mean, they have, this, uh, they have this exponential algorithm and it just like simplex algorithm just works. I mean, amazing. And then you get into the setup where, I mean, the number of states is, is billions easily and I mean, uh, a lot more than that uh, most of the time. And then, I mean, this doesn't really do anything sensible. Uh, moreover, you are actually using the exponential algorithm because no one uses the polynomial one because it's better for input sizes of I don't know what, where, well, where you cannot compute anything, anything anymore anyway. So this is not really a solution. So of course there are iterative techniques uh, such as uh, strategy iteration, where the idea is very simple. I just recall that uh, most of you know that. You just start with a random strategy and then you see where you could improve it here and there, and then you're, in many settings, you're uh, guaranteed to converge to the optimal strategy. It can, again, take exponentially many steps. Often it doesn't. I mean, it was for a long time open whether, uh, whether you can actually guarantee some polynomiality. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are some issues, like evaluating each strategy takes a lot of time. You have to try out potentially exponentially many strategies. Uh, so then what people use in practice for this particular problem is the so-called value iteration that I will talk more about. So I will explain how this works. Uh, but on a very high level, it's, uh, it's a technique that is actually the worst of all, uh, of all these techniques in the sense of uh, you don't know how, uh, well, you're not getting a precise result. Uh, you don't know how far off you are and uh, it's exponential. So this doesn't invite you to, to use this technique, but uh, on the other hand, you have to realize, well, it is convergent, so uh, maybe if, you, if we work a bit more, so we can get guarantees on uh, how far we are currently from, uh, from the actual number. Uh, and uh, it, in practice, it works reasonably fast in many cases. Okay, so this is why I'm going to look at this one and, and illustrate how you can uh, interleave it with learning and get, uh, get the best of both. Of course, there are also other techniques that are not aiming for 100% uh, per precise results. For instance, for the reason that uh, the system is not known. So if you don't really know the transition probabilities and you only... In uh, and use some information from the experience, then of course it's dependent on your luck and on how many experiments you're running and all that. So you cannot really hope for entirely correct results. But this is, this is fine. This is uh, something that we may like or may not like depending on what kind of problem that is. If it's an optimization problem for your robot so that it's, you know that the robot is behaving safe and you just want to behave it as energy aware or ecology aware or whatever aware as possible, then maybe this is the way to go because you don't really need hard guarantees. 
But if you need hard guarantees, say for safety, then uh, of course you run into troubles. So this is something that uh, for some types of systems and uh, for some objectives, uh, techniques are available uh, either under the name of uh, reinforcement learning that you have uh, heard about uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, or uh, the sort of reinvention of the same in the context of verification, which kind of copies these ideas uh, under a different name of statistical model checking, which is a, a bit misleading title, but uh, if you hear it, uh, then you know what, uh, what that is. Okay, so the idea is we want to merge these two philosophies so that uh, uh, we, get, uh, we get the best of both. First, I will recall how value iteration works. So just uh, to get an idea of, the, of, uh, of, of your background, how many of you uh, know how value iteration works? Okay, about like a fourth of the audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, what is uh, our setup? So I will start slowly. So I will start with something that is called Markov chains which is a very simple model where we don't have a non-determinism, so there are no actions. So, I mean, the number of actions of, uh, is available in each state is at most one. Some uh, in, in, in sinks you don't have, uh, or in goals you don't, may not even have any actions. And uh, our task is simple. You want to compute the probability that you reach this designed, uh, designated, uh, this designated uh, target state. How does this work? Well, you could encode it into a linear program and solve it, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to do value iteration. So what it does, it iteratively approximates this probability that uh, you can, that you, for every state S, that you can reach the goal, okay? So uh, from the initial state uh, over here, sorry. So uh, actually, maybe let me start here. Uh, from the, the goal state, the probability that you will reach the goal state is one. The probability that you reach the goal state from this sync state is zero. Uh, this is clear at the beginning. Now for you, the situation is a bit more complicated. Intuitively, uh, you will loop for some time through u and t and u and t, and at some point you will decide whether you go to one or zero. And this is at that point when you really decide it's 50-50. So actually the value is one half, and the same value is, uh, is uh, also shared by t and the initial state, okay? So now we want to get these computations and we want to get it uh, systematically. So we're going to compute this uh, under approximation L for lower bound of these values for each state. And we're, we need to realize that uh, the defining uh, equation for these values is that the probability that I will reach the goal from my current standpoint is actually, like say from you, is one third of the value of this successor plus one third of the value of this successor plus one third of the value of this successor. Okay, so this is exactly what this uh, expression is giving you. This is a weighted average of your successors. Okay, so uh, I will show you a practical demonstration of this, how uh, value iteration works. So. Uh, for this state, we know uh, the value is one. For this state, we know that the value is zero. And for all the rest, at the beginning, we assume that, uh, I mean, we want to give a safe lower bound, so we know that it's at least zero, okay? So probability is at least zero, so let me just put this naive approximation over there. And now I'm going to apply this, uh, this expression. So in the first iteration, I'm going to say, okay, my value in S is actually one times the value of T, so it's, zero. The same for t, and now it's one, one times the value of u. It's more interesting for u, because it's one-third of one plus one-third of a zero plus one-third of, uh, so let me just say one-third times zero plus one-third of the value of t, which is still zero. Okay, so this is one-third. Now I can go on, in the second iteration, I still don't really know anything about the initial state, it still just tells me, okay, it's once uh, the value of t, so this is zero, but now in t I already know, oh, my value is uh, the value of u, which is currently one-third, so let me put one-third there, and as for u, now it starts to be more interesting, 
This is one third of the value of this guy, so that's one third, plus one third of the zero, this is zero, plus, and now I have one third of the value of t, which is actually already one third. So I put this one third over here, and one third over here, and you see I get something like four ninth, okay? Which is yet closer to one half. And in the third iteration, I already know that for the initial state, it's going to be one third, and, uh, and I'm going to fill this. And at some point, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to say, oh, the value is actually very close to one half, 0 0.499, okay? So this uh, is close to truth, okay? You know that uh, you don't really know the result exactly, so maybe you would like to uh, make sure that you know about the, about the result, and uh, we will see how to do that. So if I state this as an algorithm, I can do it this way, for instance. I can say that at the beginning, everyone gets a lower bound of zero, except for the target where I know that it's already one. Okay, so this is trivial. And then what I'm going to do is, uh, it's a funnily written cycle with many gaps because we're going to fill in a lot of stuff in there. Okay, so this is why it looks so, uh, so weird. So this is a, a repeat loop where what I'm doing is actually for each of these, uh, for the outgoing transition from each state, so I mean here I was looking at this transition, so for each of them I'm going to do this so-called update, which was just evaluation of the value based on the values of the successor. Okay, so this is just describing exactly what I did on the example. And, well, yeah, then it's questionable when should we stop? And until recently, people haven't been, well, people have been looking at this, this question, but it was not, it was not clear how to, how to solve it. And people were mostly ignoring this, which was a huge shame for the very whole verification community because our model checkers are supposed to give uh, exa uh, answers that, are I mean, that we can rely on, right? And if we don't really know, I mean, there, were, there are examples where Practic, reasonably practical examples, realistic examples, where the answer of the model checker may be something like uh, 0.05, but an actual answer is like 0.7. Okay, so uh, this is of course a problem that we want to address, and uh, we're going to do that. Now, the alternative to this, uh, which is close to the, closer to the philosophy of, uh, of learning, and here it's actually just very simple statistics, uh, is, well, to run a few runs and see what happens, okay? So uh, I, I run the runs of my, on my model and then I get, uh, uh, yes, I reached the target, no, and in the next one, no, and then yes, no, yes, yes, no, no, yes, 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 no, no, no. Then I conclude, well, it's about one half, plus, minus something, I have some confidence in, on, on this. Uh, and once the confidence is good enough, then uh, I just say, so, sorry, once the confidence is, uh, is, uh, is good enough, then I just stop, okay? Uh, the point is, uh, it's not extremely, I mean, it's not really reliable, uh, but we can combine these two in something that is called uh, BRTDP. So let me tell you what, uh, what the problem actually was. I mean, we had this example over here, and there the issue was that we are often, uh, using traditional techniques, we're often investing a lot of effort into investigating states that are almost not reachable. We will not get there with high probability. So why are we spending a lot of time on this uh, and a lot of, lot, of, uh, a lot of resources? Well, we don't have to. Okay, so the idea of uh, BRTDP, which is an approach from the from the planning community, but it's actually uh, very close to what exactly uh, uh, some, some uh, types of reinforcement learning are doing, is that we are going to update, I mean, the only change here is uh, we're going to update only those transitions that we are visiting frequently. Only those that actually matter a lot. If I don't get to a particular state very often, I don't want to compute anything there. But if I'm being there all the time, then the effect, I mean, the, the, the impact of the, 
<laughs> its value to the value of the initial state is high. So I'm going, I want to take that one into account. So I'm going to update those states that are visited more frequently. So how I'm going to do that practically, I'm going to run a simulation, and I'm going to say, what I visited in my path is something that I, well, visited frequently, I visited that once, and all the rest, n not at all. So I'm going to update these states, or these transitions. But only those that I visited. And then I run another one, and then I update these states. And this way, I'm updating a lot of states. I'm maybe not covering uh, soon the whole state space, which is good, because I want to ignore parts that are uh, barely reachable. And I may be updating a lot those states that are really visited frequently, that are really important. And uh, this way, we actually converge to the true number much faster, experimentally. Okay? And, I mean, there are good reasons for that. But the point is, if it was hard to say uh, when the value iteration gives you a precise uh, enough result already, so when the approximation is close enough, here it's even harder. You're not even sticking to any prescribed order of updates, you're just doing it randomly all over the place and you have absolutely no idea how far away from the result you are. Okay, so for Markov chains, there is a simple fix. You not only have a lower bound on the result, but you also have an upper bound on the result. And when the lower and upper bound are close enough, then you know the result is in between, and you know that the error of the result cannot be more than that. So this gives you the imprecision. So it's as simple as actually adding this upper bound, which has exactly the same defining uh, value, uh, same defining equation, just the initial value is different. So you say that everything has an upper bound of 1 except for the sink that trivially has 0. Okay? So actually it translates uh, to the least and greatest fixed point of this uh, higher order operator uh, and it's not, uh, it's not, in this context, it's not maybe uh, surprising that uh, it actually works. Uh, but for instance, it doesn't work for Markov decision processes, and I will get back to that. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this is the time point where you say, okay, I have enough. The difference between my upper and lower approximation of of, uh, in the, of the value in the initial state is small enough. I can stop, and uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of funny things you do here, as long as you have a valid lower and upper bound. The order in which you update things could be driven by the most uh, uh, dark magic uh, uh, learning approach uh, you can find. There is absolutely no need for reliability of this approach. I mean, just whatever will work, okay? Preferably, you, ha you take something that actually happens to, uh, or most of the system happens to be working fast, but if it doesn't, then you're just slower. You're not incorrect. Okay, so then this is a sort of uh, recipe how to incorporate something that where you can cannot trust the results, but you kind of wrap it into something that uh, that is also trustable. But still, you are you are actually doing the same computation as the reinforcement learning would be doing. Uh, well, I mean here it's simple statistics, but uh, let's let's move on to actually reinforcement learning uh, on MDPs. So before I go to the reinforcement learning. Let me then uh, recall once again the, the value iteration approach. So the difference here is uh, the following. The, now we have actions. So we're actually updating. There's not only single outgoing uh, transition from, from a state. There could be more. So you have to, uh, you have to, uh, you have to treat uh, these more complicated objects. How do you do that? How do you update these things? Well, for a, if you're in a particular state and a particular action, then the formula is exactly the same as before. So you take the weighted average of the successors of their values and you do the very same thing. On top of that, you also now have to say, which action should I play? Well, uh, the upper bound is uh, of a state, of the value of the state, is certainly the best of the actions. So you take the best of the actions best of their values, and this is, this is your value. Okay, for lower bound, just be careful you don't take the minimum, 
because you actually want to maximize the probability. Okay, so if you have a lower bound in, in one action, so if you have a A and B, and here the value is something between 0 0.7, 0 point, sorry, is 0.3 to 0.7, and here it's 0.4 to 0.5, then what is the upper bound on this state? Well, you cannot definitely get more than 0.7. But what is the lower bound? Well, you can definitely get at least 0.4. Okay, maybe choosing the non-optimal action, but I mean, you have the guarantee of getting at least 0.4. So it's not the minimum, and it's not, I mean, necessarily the same action. So this is just to, uh, not to confuse you. Okay? Uh, okay? Everything is fine. Actually, this works in the case where we have a guarantee that we will sooner or later reach uh, the target or the sink. For the general case, I will, I will uh, need to do more, and I will show you later. Okay, but let's assume for the moment that we have this setup, which is actually very often, uh, the, I mean, this is the setup that is considered, in, for instance, in probabilistic uh, scheduling, because, well, the general, uh, the general setup is somehow too complicated, or, I mean, more complicated than this one, and then uh, their techniques are not really applicable there, and uh, you, have to, you have to work more for that. Okay, but this is the value iteration. Now, yes, please. Okay, so the question is, in this example, in this example, uh, why is uh, the lower bound 0 0.4? So first of all, we are computing the lower bound on the maximal probability. We are maximizing the probability to get to the target. So this is not uh, the minimum probability. So we still are approximating the maximum. And if you want to approximate, if you want to get the most, uh, I mean the, the, the highest values, then in uh, this case, of course, one could say, okay, we can go for A, and then we have a chance of 0 0.7, but we're risking that we're just getting 0 0.3. So uh, if you really want to see what is definitely guaranteed, then you should play it safe and take B with guaranteed 0 0.4. It's maybe not giving you the best, uh, best value, but it's definitely a value that you can get if you want. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, another question. Well, uh, we, we should, hmm? should know what is your sink state and what is your, uh, your goal state. Whereas in those approaches, you don't need those assumptions. So you are putting some strong assumptions here to, for your approach to work. Okay, thank you for the question. So the question is basically, uh, we are having very strong assumptions of having a target and a goal here which are not very realistic, and uh, these are assumptions that we don't have when we, for instance, don't know the system. I definitely agree. I am going to lift these assumptions later. This is what, I mean, you have to work quite a bit to get, uh, to get this lifted, okay? So as I presented here at first is with these assumptions to clarify what I'm going to do, and then, once uh, the technique is clear, then I, I can show how to actually uh, work with that. So I'm going to deal with that later. So at the end of this procedure, uh, do you have a strategy? Because, for example, here, uh, both A and B have uh, its uh, advantages and disadvantages. So at the end of this procedure, as it is written here, what you have is the values. So in principle, if uh, you are in a state and you have two actions and one of them has, uh, so I mean, in the end, the decisive value where you go for is the upper bound for technical reasons that I'm not going to deal with now. So if you have two actions and one of the uh, upper bounds uh, is 0 0.8 and the other upper bound is 0 0.7, then you go for 0 0.8.
If you have two actions and both of them in the end have 0.8, then you may not know what to do. So the strategy that ensures that uh, you will get this uh, would be the one that randomizes between the two, and that would be sufficient. Uh, however, you can also equip this algorithm with uh, a tiny bit of more information remembered in each state, basically telling you which is the action that you should be taking. So, I mean, there is always one action that you can definitely take, but if you don't know, you can just randomize between all the good ones. There's a question in the back. So the question is, how do you generate these diagrams? How do you generate these systems, right? I mean, for instance, the one here in the corner. Uh, so in, uh, in uh, the setup that I am mostly interested in, you have a description in a sort of programming language. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a tool called Prism, and it has a programming language uh, called Prism language which basically is a language of reactive modules on the theoretical level. So how does it look? Uh, basically, you have a collection of modules which are independent units that are running their computation on their own. You have synchronizing actions. Um, so you can basically synchronize two modules. Uh, you can uh, make computation steps in your module which are basically guarded commands. So you have a set of variables, and uh, then you have guarded commands such as if x is greater than 5 and y is smaller than 3, then I can perform this action, which means that with one half I will decrease y by 2, and I will, uh, with one half I will increase x by 7. So this is an a sample language. Of course, there can be, I mean, there are languages used in planning, there are languages used here and there. This is just... Uh, uh, sort of academic language that makes things theoretically nice and easy to, 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 to describe. But in principle, uh, I assume that you have a structure on the state space given by some programming language with variables and with their values. I'm going to focus mostly on integral uh, variables. I mean, so just integers, nothing, uh, nothing fancy. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so this is, this is how you get them. And how you get this programming language in the first place, or how you get the model of your system when you have, I mean, you, have, you build a robot in your garage. Of course, you don't get the MDP, uh, but I mean, from your code that is running there, maybe you can build, uh, build your model. But of course, this is an issue that you have to model your, model your system. Yes, please. Well, where do the probabilities come from the outside world? This is a, a next good question. Where do the probabilities come from? So, and can you trust them? So, uh, the probabilities come from basically two sources. One of them is just experience that you cannot really trust maybe too much. The other source is uh, if there is a, say, a, a component that can fail with uh, one uh, one hundredth uh, throughout the mission uh, of length, I don't know, uh, one year, you get this number from the guy who sells this component. And uh, then you take it as an assumption. And if it actually fails more often than that, well, it may be your problem, but that is not your responsibility. I mean, you took, uh, you took I mean, it's clear that uh, the other guy screwed up, okay? So uh, in the certification view where you kind of look for, did I do my job right? Uh, so that the authorities say, okay, this is fine then, uh, yeah, if something happens and then you did your job well, and then if uh, actually they say that uh, the component only face, fails one per 100 years and it fails every other day, then it's the vendor of that component who actually lied to you, right? So then at least it's, uh, I mean, you're not going to save the world with that just if you verify your own uh, work. Uh, you have to rely on work of the others. And then, uh, well, yeah, then they probably give you something that uh, they are comfortable with and then maybe they use some uh, verification techniques or maybe not. Yes, please. Uh, that's a, a wonderfully vivid example you've given of vendors and, and probabilities. In real life, many components fail in a bathtub curve. Mm -hmm. um, so the probability isn't constant. You could run around the side. Absolutely. I'm just interested, because it's such a great image, um, how easy is that kind of variability? Mm -hmm. 
to yeah. um, accommodate. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So the question was, uh, normally you don't have a constant probability uh, of component failing, but uh, they typically fail at the beginning because they're wrong or they work for some time and when they're old enough then the probability that they will fail soon is, is getting higher. So in that case, uh, one of the approaches, I mean there are more, but one of the approaches is actually switch to uh, such uh, continuous time models where you actually can uh, model the flow of time and the actual delays between uh, uh, the times when components fail and so on. So you can uh, enrich the model a bit and uh, I mean in continuous time microdecision process you're using exponentially time, uh, exponentially distributed uh, waiting times with which you can, you can combine them and actually model whatever curve you want more or less efficiently depending on what, the, what type of curve uh, you're interested in. And then of course the analysis gets a bit uh, trickier uh, and more importantly the model gets a bit messier so that's why I'm not talking about this here uh, because it's technically more complicated uh, but similar ideas apply. I mean we are working on that as well and I mean it's more work uh, but still it can be done. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, one more question here, yeah. Uh, a very good question. Uh, when we look at uh, the updates uh, here, is this update from the current iteration or from the previous iteration? Those of you who have seen uh, some iterative methods, uh, yes, you can improve by taking already the, the, uh, the new uh, iteration or you can stick to the old one which has slightly different, uh, I mean you're getting slightly different numbers, meanwhile you're still converging to the same thing, so it doesn't really matter. You can take the current one, you can take the previous one, uh, I mean the current one has the advantage of you converging faster a bit uh, and it's still correct, so uh, then this is a small improvement, standard improvement uh, in iterative methods, yes. But it depends on your architecture, if you can actually take the vector and do everything at once, uh, then on these parallel architectures you wouldn't take the, the new result because that would, you would spend more time on getting that one uh, rather than just doing the, 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 using the old one very fast. So it really depends. Okay, so this was, uh, this was value iteration on MDPs. Now let's enrich it to, uh, to uh, uh, BRTDP, so by the way BRTDP uh, stands for Bounded Real-Time Dynamic Programming, a notion from the, from the probabilistic planning. And uh, here we are doing the very same thing as before. We also want to visit, uh, we also want to update those states that are visited very frequently. So you again sample a path and here I'm assuming that you will end up almost surely in one of the, either in the target or in the sink. I will lift this assumption later and you update these transitions. What is the problem here? How do you simulate a Markov decision process? Well, you can resolve the transition probabilities randomly according to the probabilities, okay? But what, how do you resolve the non-determinism? Okay, you actually want to visit, uh, you want to update those states that are visited frequently by what? By the optimal schedule. You're trying to compute that one. So you don't really have it. So the idea is, well, maybe then if I don't have the optimal one, let me try to uh, focus on the states that are visited frequently by a good scheduler, reasonably good scheduler. Well, you don't have that one either yet. I mean, at the beginning, you don't have anything. But uh, that's where, where the reinforcement learning uh, can help you. It can give you a good scheduler. Okay, it's, it's not uh, giving you guaranteed uh, best one, but it can give you a reasonably good schedule, maybe pretty fast. So uh, you just need to get, uh, get one uh, that is reasonably good. And this is where uh, you can use reinforcement learning. And uh, I mean here for, for us, reinforcement learning is uh, more or less uh, a black box uh, where I mean, basically, the, the, all we need to know about the principle is, well, uh, try out an action, and if it turns out to be bad, next time try another one. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I mean, you know about reinforcement learning by now more than is actually uh, even necessary here. And the recipe here, and here it's digested into a single line, 
uh, that the, that the uh, reinforcement learning buys you is pick the currently best looking action, the one with the highest potential. Okay, the potentially the, the best one with the, with the highest upper bound, the one that is promising you, I could give you a lot if, uh, if things are nice. Okay? And later on, if it turns out that actually it's, it cannot promise that much, then you take another one. And you always try to go for the gold mine, and if it doesn't work out, then you, you try out something else next time. And if actually you resolve it this way, then you're guaranteed to... Uh, I mean, the whole, the whole algorithm is guaranteed to converge, and, uh, and you're going to terminate when, when the error is, is small enough. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit tricky on the, on the technical level, uh, but intuitively it's, uh, it's kind of clear that uh, this is what you should do. You try to maximize, so you always try to go for the best looking one, and only if you know that this is actually not that good, then you switch to something else, to your B plan, okay? So for instance, it wouldn't really work uh, if, uh, if there was uh, a lower bound here or if you just I mean, twisted this. I mean, it's quite sensitive to, to this particular formula, this algorithm, but uh, uh, this way, uh, this way it, uh, it works. And intuitively, the reasoning is, is I hope, uh, quite clear. So if we look at this, uh, and th this is actually, if you look at this, this is uh, what is used in, in, in many reinforcement learning algorithms uh, where you have, I mean, Q-learning algorithms where you have a value of a, of a state, a value of an action, and this is actually taken from, uh, from this approach is taken from the, the pack learning for MDPs that uh, that I spoke about and that I will uh, that I will speak one more time about. Now, what has happened? So uh, we were doing all the time this value iteration, and uh, we were passing this information about the lower and upper bounds that we computed to this learner, and this learner is running its own reinforcement learning algorithm telling us where the important parts of the system are, where should we focus our resources, where should we do the computation. And there, once we do that, we focus on this small part, we do the computation more precisely than the learning approaches usually do because then they need a lot of data, they need uh, a lot of experience. We, they are not used to the setup of having the model. We actually here, in this particular setup, are having the model. We know the transition probabilities, we can do the computations precisely and quickly, and then we can pass the information to the learner faster than the learner would realize that on his own, and allowing the learner thus to give us a, even a better advice on what is the important part of the system. So they are strengthening each other because uh, they are doing, I mean, they're doing different things and they're passing the results of their analysis uh, to the other guy. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, now you may ask, we are updating states that are visited frequently. Uh, does that mean that I just update some of these states a bit more often and I still have to update all the clouds, all the rest that is not important? Or is it the case that maybe I can ignore most of the system and instead of uh, looking at the billion state system, I, I look at five states only, like I, I showed in the example. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> well, the reality is somewhere in between, of course. So firstly, there are cases where you have to visit almost all the states and it, this doesn't help too much. There are cases where you have millions of states and actually, if you run this algorithm uh, with a required precision 10 to minus 6, so that in the end you are, have a very precise result, you know that the, the probability is 0 0.02 plus minus 10 to minus 6, then it's actually enough to look at a small fraction 
of the state space. So with the, using the reinforcement learning, we only see a small fraction of the state space and the rest is just visited so infrequently and has such low impact on the overall value that it's all hidden in this 10 to minus 6. So that doesn't mean that if you visit like a thousand times smaller part of the state space that you are a thousand times uh, faster. There is a bit of overhead and, and, and all that. Uh, but certainly it's, it's a way how to avoid working on things that you actually never wanted to work on. You just didn't know that you don't have to. And learning told you that uh, maybe you don't have to and then you checked this guess. You check the numbers and the difference between the lower and upper bound tells you how much you don't know yet. And it turns out to be just so little. So you're happy about that. If it was large, then it means, oh, I have to explore more. And it would take more time. But you have this way a good chance of actually not looking at the whole thing. And uh, only doing what is really necessary. So we're using it as a, as a we're using learning as a heuristic to speed up the standard value iteration. That's one way to put it. Uh, the other way to put it is also that uh, we are running reinforcement learning with guarantees. Now in the setup of uh, having in the setup of uh, uh, of known model, which is of course unrealistic in, uh, in the usual machine learning setups. So I'm also going to comment on uh, the setup with unknown model uh, shortly. But before I do that, I still want to show an idea how you actually lift this assumption of uh, certainty of uh, getting to the target or to the goal. And this is, this is actually the work that you have to do to make it work for verification. So this is a purely, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm not going to speak about that too much, but this work is purely in the kind of the verification block so that you can actually adapt the learning to that context. So uh, let, me, let me show you the problem. So the problem has a name, it is called end components. And I'm not going to define that precisely, those of you who know that, uh, uh, good for you. For those of you who don't know that, the only thing that uh, you really need to know about this is, it's a part of the state space where you can stay forever uh, without leaving it and uh, so for instance this one here is an end component you can just run a b a b a b and stay there and you 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 don't leave it if there was with 0 0.00001 there was a, a transition to m3 then m1 m2 wouldn't be an end component Okay, so let's see what, uh, well, another, another uh, end, end component that you can, uh, you can uh, happen to visit is, is one where, I mean, you just go through the system and at some point you go to an end component where the target is not there, the sink is not there, and you're just running around and you're waiting for zero or one to occur and it's not happening. Okay, so this is actually not only a problem, uh, I mean, this is not only the assumption that we are lifting now, this is actually, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a bigger problem. So let's, uh, let me show you the problem. I, yeah, let me show you the problem. Let me first erase this. So what happens with the value iteration? So let me, let me run this uh, on this simple example. So the value here is zero, the value here is one. Okay, we know that. Now, the, uh, the upper values are 1 here. The lower values, I will write them below, are, are 0. And now you start updating. So, I mean, if you update M1 uh, or M2, nothing is happening. If you update M3, then you realize, oh, I'm actually having 1 half. So, I'm, in the next iteration, you're not having 1 and 1, 1 and 0, but you have 1 half and 1 half. So, you actually have already a precise result. But now let's look at M2. If you want to update M2, you know that, uh, okay, the lower bound is not zero, it's one half. I could go to C. But I really don't want to because uh, I really want to go, I really want to take B because the upper bound there is one. And I will keep my upper bound one because M1 is telling me, oh, maybe we could get one. 
Why is M1 thinking that we could get one? Well, M1 is thinking that because M2 is promising me that. And this is what I don't see as M2 that actually I'm thinking I am getting, I mean, this one is relying on this one. And what I'm not seeing is that this one actually only relies on this action and on that one again. So we're living in an illusion like, yeah, maybe I will give you a million dollars. And then uh, the other guy says, oh, he's giving me maybe a million dollars. Maybe I can also give you a million dollars. I mean, if you give me one, then I can give it to you. And then, I mean, we, none of us has a million dollars, right? Uh, but we are living in an illusion that we can do these transactions. Because we are mutually promising that to, I mean, it's actually capitalism works like that, right? Uh, money is not non-existent, but uh, uh, I, yeah, okay. But we don't want that here, because what happens is that one stays here, and you're not converging to the actual value, which is one half. You're only converging in, uh, with, the, with the lower bounds. So the point is, we have this problem that these two guys are, I mean, they have a, a sort of company that uh, uh, makes, them, uh, makes them believe that uh, uh, they are rich, but they're not. So what we have to do is we have to take all these guys and kind of collapse them. Uh, so turn this into a single state where there is no self loop, uh, like there is no AB. The only chance to do something that is visible to the outside world, like rather than promising virtual million dollars, is actually take the action C out of here. And then the value of this big state is actually, uh, is with probability one, I'm going to get the value of M3, which is one half, one half. Okay, so the general recipe is identify these end components and contract them. Now, if you don't know the whole system, uh, it's not entirely easy to identify what these end components are, and you have to do it, I mean, from the part of the system that you have seen, uh, and then you have to contract a part of the end component, and maybe later on you realize, oh, there was one more guy in this company, so I have to also attach this guy uh, and, and, con and, and collapse uh, this guy uh, together with, uh, with, the, the, with the original EC. And uh, so, I mean, this is an iterative process, but this actually solves the issue. And this also solves the issue of uh, this assumption that I will reach zero or one in the end. Why? Uh, because if I, at some point, end up in some area where we are, I mean, kind of running in circles and not getting anywhere, we're not getting zero, we're not getting one, we realize at some point, oh, this is actually an end component. Let me collapse this, this company. So this becomes one big huge state, which uh, doesn't, I mean, these inner transitions are not there anymore. It had no outgoing transitions, or if it had no outgoing transitions, then this changes into a sink. And then you see, oh, well, I'm in a sink, so, uh, I, uh, I, can, uh, I can use the previous analysis. Okay. So this is, uh, I mean, not very detailed, but as I said, this is on the verification part. This is what you actually have to do if you want to do reachability instead of, uh, instead of uh, say, discounted reward, as in the case of, of a learning algorithm. And I will comment on that actually here. Uh, and this issue is, so what I'm going to do on this slide is I would like to take a step back and see what we have, uh, what we have achieved compared to reinforcement learning and uh, can we actually give something back to the setup where the model is not known. So the setup for the reinforcement learning or for the statistical model checking, can we actually uh, offer now more uh, to uh, to the, to the people who don't know their models. So what do I mean there by the setup that we, the model is not known? Uh, so I'm assuming uh, that I'm completely observing my state space, okay? So this is maybe something that is not actually, I mean, well, in some reinforcement learning setups this is possible, in some you have partial observability. Now I'm assuming complete observability of the state, so I know what is the content of my memory at that particular point, I just don't know what is going to happen next. 
So I don't see the transition probabilities. I see which actions are available now, but I don't really know what they're doing. Now, of course, in this setup, we cannot use our algorithm. Uh, we cannot, uh, and what is the reason? The only part where we needed the transition probabilities was here. Line two, sorry, line two and line three. We were taking, we are deducing the value of a state based on the values of the successors using the exact transition probabilities. And this is actually the only point where I needed them. So let me just focus on one of them. I mean, they're the same, so let me just take this one. So what I'm going to do is instead, I may be using the experimental average. Okay, so I'm running through the system and I'm collecting the information uh, and uh, this, is, this is then good enough. Uh, it's not entirely precise. There is some risk, it's completely wrong. So this is actually leading to the probably approximately correct uh, algorithms. Uh, also known as the model checking in, in some communities. And uh, this is actually the original algorithm that, uh, I mean, the, these are the guys who came up with, uh, with, uh, with this approach, uh, where they, and I, I will show the algorithm, and I will derive their algorithm sort of from our algorithm that we have seen, Although in reality it was the other way around, right? I mean, that algorithm that you have seen was derived from that one. But let me see how, I mean, you already know that, uh, the one that I presented, so let me show you the, the original one and, and let, me, let me show you how you get from one to the other, uh, be it in any direction. You have a question? Let me, let me show you, let me show, this is, this is to come. Okay. Good. Uh, now, what I wanted to say before I show you the algorithm is that uh, this algorithm, actually, as it is in this paper, is for so-called discounted reward. I'm not going to define that exactly. Uh, I'm just going to say that their result was PAC, also in the sense that uh, they were... They had, polyn they had to run it for polynomially many steps, this algorithm, until they get a uh, good enough policy. Uh, so this is often a part of the PAC definition that uh, the good, probably approximately correct result is happening in, in, in polynomial time. This is not possible for reachability because even, uh, for instance, for a system that looks like this, that with one half goes onwards to the right and with one half goes back to the beginning, then if you measure how long it takes to get a simulation starting from here to there, it's exponential in the length of the, of the system. So only to run a single, single successful uh, simulation, it takes exponential time. So you cannot really hope for getting a result in polynomial time based on the simulations. Uh, at least not, not in the naive way. Uh, moreover, uh, for, uh, for verification, we wanted to have both the lower and upper bound so that we know how far we are from each other. Okay, in, uh, in this paper, uh, they really don't need the, the lower bound uh, because they are, not, not, they are fine enough with, with the upper bound. However, even if we only took their upper bound, still one would have to do this end component trick uh, to make this work for reachability. So what I want to say with that is that if you take the algorithms that are in the uh, reinforcement learning area, you still have to do some work to use them. Okay, so you still have to uh, do the verification specific things such as, well, reachability is a specific objective that is not so interesting maybe for uh, people working in, in, in reinforcement learning or for robotics people, for instance, where they're working with rewards and so on. Uh, so this is specific and then it requires you to do some tricks and then also these bounds is some, some more work that you have to do. Okay, but now let me show you the, the way how to move to a system where you don't know the model, where you don't know the transition probabilities. 
Well, the idea that they came up with is um, actually you have to try out many runs before you conclude that actually the upper bound really should decrease. So you should run uh, through the system a long time to get some kind of confidence. And once you're changing the values, you should be always somehow on the safe side. You should not really uh, take the values that you got uh, experimentally, but uh, I mean, take it on the, I mean, take some safety margin somewhere so that in the end you get the prob probably approximately correct result. How do you do that? Well, there is a simple procedure for that. So we only, recall, we only need to replace uh, this update procedure, right? So for the, for the upper and lower bounds, so I will demonstrate it for the upper bound. So it goes like this. It waits until you have seen a transition many times. M stands for many. Uh, I'm not going to give the formula for many. Uh, it's pretty large, but uh, doesn't, doesn't matter at the moment. If you don't have many enough uh, uh, visits, if you don't have enough experience, then what you do is you can take uh, the value that you experimentally see in this run, this particular step, and you add it to your uh, accumulated, uh, accumulated value, and you say, oh, I've, I have one more visit to this, to this action. So in this accumulator, if you divide it by the counter, then you have the experimental average. Okay, so what you do then, uh, at some point you see, oh, if my experimental value, that's the experimental average, is smaller than uh, the current upper bound estimate, well, let me change the estimate and uh, decrease it to the, what I experimentally experienced. And then let me start all over this process. Okay, instead of actually using the real transition probabilities. Okay, all very nice. Except that this doesn't work, because I mean it's, random, so you have to take care of that. So what you have to do is, you have to now uh, be a bit safer. Uh, so uh, you have some experimental average, but you may have been a bit lucky or unlucky, depending on the way you view it, and actually the, the average is lower than the real value, a bit. Although, I mean, you have like a law of large numbers, but I mean, there could be like a small margin. So let me put this small margin here, so that I'm not decreasing it too much. Then, of course, uh, I need to check that it's smaller than uh, the current value minus this Xi because I'm going to add the Xi, okay? So that at least I'm making a change. All very nice, handles this, this issue, except that it, the whole thing still doesn't work. Why is that? Uh, if you wait long enough with this, uh, what happens? So let's, let's take a more practical example. You're uh, trying to learn uh, what is the probability of winning a lottery if you uh, do this or that. And then you do a lot of experiments and uh, you run uh, billions, trillions, zillions of experiments. And then at some point it will happen that uh, I mean, it was Tuesday afternoon, it was raining between two and three and then you were jumping on your left leg and then you won the lottery 10 times in a row. And if you're going to, if you're doing the experiment long enough, this is going to happen. Okay, maybe not in your lifetime, but I mean, at some point it would happen. So you will win the lottery 10 times in a row and you will conclude, oh, that was an amazing action. Let me repeat that. And maybe that is, that is the way how to get, uh, to become a millionaire. Okay, it's just that you had a very long experiment. So at that point of time, uh, after zillions of steps, there must have been a small period of time where you won the lottery several times in a row. So you could get a complete nonsense if you run the experiment for a long enough time. So what you actually have to add, and this is what the reinforcement learning people have there, is you have to stop this process reasonably soon. So you have this funny macro, don't read the definition at the, at the, at the bottom now. You have this funny macro telling you whether you should still change the value, should still learn, learn uh, the value of this action or not. Whether you should fix it or whether you should continue running the experiment. And uh, now uh, the definition actually down there is, is pretty horrible. Basically what it does is it checks how much you have been updating things. And if you, uh, so you're running through the system and you have your, your one, of the, one of the, we are now focusing our attention to one particular action. And you have seen this action m times 
And then you have maybe changed its value, so now you go again, and then you run it m times. You're ready to change the value, but you see, oh, I'm getting basically the same value as I had before. So I'm not changing it. And if this happens twice in a row, so I mean you give it one more go, but if it still doesn't change, then you say, okay, I'm done with that. Unless someone else who is relevant is going to change his value, and in that case, I'm going to relearn. But for now, I'm stopping the experiment here so that I don't screw up by this long, long experiment when I, at some point, get a complete nonsense. And therefore, I only change my value when it's kind of significant, because I, otherwise I would always, very often, I would change my value a tiny bit and a tiny bit and a tiny bit, and it wouldn't work. So actually, I have this one more extra two here, so that if I'm changing my value, I'm changing it significantly by some psi. And now it finally works. Okay, so this is the, this is the pack reinforcement learning approach uh, as derived from the, the, the BRTDP algorithm. Although, I mean, in reality, it's the other way around. Okay, so... Uh, uh, to, to sum this up... Uh, one of the issues that uh, one has to fight is a different objective. So instead of discounted reward, uh, we deal with reachability, which is more complicated. And, uh, well, how is, it, uh, how is it more complicated? Well, the feedback that you're getting is very slow. So you have to run a long simulation until you see that it was a good one or not. If you have discounted reward, which is basically a number on that action telling you whether it's a good action or not, I mean, you immediately, I mean, with, with robots, I mean, it, uh, when, when you pick up something that you should deliver somewhere, you get your points. When you deliver it, you get your points. Uh, when you touch something and you burn your sensors, then you get negative points. I mean, you immediately get rewards. And this helps you to, uh, to identify good strategies faster. With reachability, this is harder. And this is what we work on mostly in, in, in verification, uh, these kind of properties. Uh, and also, uh, this incurs the, 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 the problem of the end components that you have to work on. Moreover, you have to keep these upper and lower bounds, whereas in the Q learning, uh, you just have one Q value, and mostly you don't really uh, care about like, how far off you are. I mean, you're getting something reasonable. Uh, and yeah, the, the whole thing is, is caused by, of course, the desire for exact bounds, uh, whereas, I mean, yeah, you have, uh, I mean, Probably approximately correct bounds are immediately uh, much easier to achieve. Uh, and what actually is used in practice is, is things where you have no bounds, often even some even faster things that where you don't even know whether they converge or not. Okay, practically they do, but uh, who knows. And uh, the, the idea is that you have to exchange this information where this guy delivers the information about that is very hard to capture formally. What does it mean that something is important, that it's valuable to look at? Okay, so this is something that you get uh, from this informal part and uh, from the more formal part you get this better, uh, or I mean more precise algorithms for, for computing something that give better data to the, to the learner. Uh, you can extend this uh, and uh, I'm going to quickly comment on this. You can extend this to different objectives. So for instance, there is this uh, long run average reward or mean payoff, which is basically you take, uh, you take the average of the, of the money that you're earning on your long run. So I mean, this is defined through the limit, but in, intuitively, if you go say here and then you cycle here, then it's an average of 42, 24, 24, 24, and so on, which is three. So it kind of ignores the prefix. Uh, so that's why it's called long run average or uh, mean payoff. Uh, it's kind of uh, the average over the whole run, sort of. And uh, that one can be decomposed into, uh, into a part that is uh, about reachability. So it's actually all about reaching one of the end components where you stay, the blue one, the red one, or the green one, and then computing the best uh, reward on that each component. And again, the philosophy is the same. 
The philosophy, so I mean, these are the actual uh, uh, averages in each end component, and then you can just choose whether you stay in, uh, in the blue one or you want to go to the green or red. The philosophy is still the same. Uh, you don't want to look at areas that are almost that have very low probability of being reached. Uh, you don't want to uh, you don't want to uh, spend too much time on uh, looking at states where you know almost exactly what the value is. Here you know it's seven because it's just one state. It could be two more states and. <clears throat> You only converge very, I mean, uh, to in, in, in the infinity, but you very quickly know the almost actual value, and then you don't want to invest too much effort in polishing it by uh, 10 to minus 10, and you rather want to look at uh, the states that are very uncertain, where you don't know anything about the value, and you want to look at, uh, you don't want to look at, for instance, on this blue one. Uh, because it's it's not very profitable. I mean, you see, I, I'm getting around six. Well, here I know exactly six, but if it was uh, approximation, it would be around six. Here I know it's around seven, so let me rather investigate this part more. Okay, so you can, for different reasons, you can ignore different parts of the state space, and this is what the learning buys you. And this is kind of a, a, a different recap for the same thing. Uh, by keeping the lower and upper bound, you actually... Uh, can do all sort of funny stuff that is not guaranteed to do anything reasonable because you know that your upper and lower bound is still valid. And then uh, you do some crazy uh, learning to try to identify something and, and do whatever crazy stuff, you still have the guarantee of the upper and lower bound. Okay, so this is a general recipe how to integrate something that is not safe. And um, yeah, this also the difference between the two gives you the error bound, so this tells you where the imprecision comes from, and you can focus your attention there. And uh, and uh, yeah, so you can treat uh, the, the the highly imprecise uh, states only. And now uh, you can plug in all sorts of funny stuff, so like simulations, reinforcement learning, and then this helps you. Use the transition use of the transition properties helps you to identify which are the highly reachable states. Picking the best action tells you which are the most profitable states or looking as most profitable states and this helps you to really focus your resources where they're needed. And yeah, okay, just to illustrate that uh, before, uh, bef before without uh, this ignoring based on learning, uh, linear programming, funny enough, was actually working pretty well compared to other techniques. Uh, most importantly, because the, with the value iteration, you didn't get any idea what is the correct uh, what is the correct result. You were just slowly converging to something and not knowing anything. But once you start ignoring these things, then you see that the scalability goes up, and and you're much better than uh, than, than linear programming. Also, in this more complicated setup. So this is just uh, uh, times uh, in, in seconds. And uh, let me. If, if uh, you're fine with that, I would spend one more minute uh, just telling you that uh, you can also extend it to other models. I've been speaking about Markov decision processes. Many of you are probably from a setup where you don't work with probabilities at all, uh, or uh, then you're interested in games. Okay, you can do similar things with games where it's, it's, it's harder. I'm going to, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at stochastic games for a second. Just to show you that basically the very same approach works entirely flawlessly for these for these games, except that uh, that EC problem, the, this end component problem, and uh, then the problem here is in a nutshell is if I have two players, one of them tries to minimize, the other tries to maximize. Let's say that the value here is 0 0.3 and the value here is 0 0.5 then I know that the value here is also 0 0.5, the value here is uh, 0 0.3, and the value of the minimizer, well, he will pick this one, so he will also get 0 0.3. Okay, so actually it's these two guys who form a company uh, who have the same value, and this guy, uh, this guy doesn't. If the values were different, then it may happen that the other case happens, so, I mean, the end components are not, it's not clear who belongs to whom in these games. 
So you have to work a bit harder to actually figure out who belongs to whom, and this can change dynamically as you get uh, the numbers from the algorithm, then maybe it was 0 0.3, 0 0.5, but if I realize that it's not 0 0.5, but 0 0.2 only, then actually it turns out to be not this case anymore, but now it's this case, where these two guys have the same value. So you have to dynamically do these kind of things and it leads to more complicated things that you have to solve on the verification side. So you have to do some sort of uh, playing around with the values and, 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 and changing them in appropriate ways. Uh, but this is, uh, this is just for that particular model, for that particular objective, but the general idea stays exactly the same and the algorithm stays exactly the same. Just this easy problem deep in the verification context has to be handled a bit differently.